Hi everyone, I'm Sostein. Welcome to my channel. Meet Elspeth, of course. If you saw my last video on making house dresses, you'll remember I said that my next project was going to be the dress that Sophie wears in Howl's Moving Castle. This was the plan all along, of course, but a few months back, I posted several ideas for a bunch of Ghibli core dresses on my Instagram. And it's on Sostein, and if you're wondering, that's where I kind of post all my previews. And I've been slowly my working my way through these drawings. You'll notice which ones I've completed and which ones I haven't yet, and which ones I've completed and do not want to show anyone because it's horrible. Um, but it's getting there. And if you're wondering what Ghibli Core is, it's an aesthetic that I made up that encompasses the simple yet girly dresses that are worn by many of Ghibli characters, such as Ponyo, Kiki, and of course, Sophie. So let's first talk about Sophie's look. She actually wears several iterations of the same dress and they all have the same shape. And even at the end, um, when she's like the happy Sophie, she basically wears the same dress, but it's a brighter color and with a ruffle at the bottom. She doesn't really change her look at all, which is good for her. Why should she just change her look just because she's got a man now? Like that's, yeah, that's not okay. So I'm glad that she does that. The dress itself is simple and flattering. It's a long sleeve dress, loose, fitted at the waist with a yoke in the front. The yoke itself has three buttons, one, two, three, which we never see to be functional and a collar of some sort with some white lace at the edge. This dress is frequently worn with an apron and it's actually interesting. I just wanna say everything here is conjecture. I'm not a dress historian. I would refer you to my friend Abby Cox for her dress history, but I would say that Everything that she wears vaguely resembles Victorian wrappers. These were dresses worn anywhere from the 1840s to the early 1900s. They were frequently yoked and they were one piece long dresses, frequently made out of very functional cotton calico that they would wear on top of other dresses to do chores around the house. And this would protect their main clothes. They were itself only shaped by the yoke and belted at the waist to give some waistline, but really it wasn't about the shape so much as being practical. So I think that there are two ways to think of costuming the dress. First off, you could say, what if this was a real period and this were a real garment that was to, was in the past? What would it be? What would she wear? And what pattern would I use to sew it? So if I were going by that historical slash real version, I think it would be this pattern by Laughing Moon. It's an 1840s to 1860s wrapper. So I personally think that this is probably closest to the shape that Sophie would actually be wearing had the movie been set in our world. And I think this is because it's a wrapper. It's very practical. You just drape it on, button a few buttons in the front and belt it. It's easy to wear, easy to clean, and it fits Sophie's practical yet sensible nature. I'm just not a big fan of the way it looks, it's not that flattering as an actual waistband. And I thought it was, eh, you know, it's my house dress, I wanna feel pretty in it, and I don't think I would feel particularly pretty in a wrapper. So the second way to costume this dress is to say it's a made up dress and a made up time period and made up world, which it is. It's totally made up, like everything about it's made up. Yeah, there's some 1890s elements, there's some 1860s elements, there's some early 1900s elements, but, at the end of the day, it's a made up world with magic. And what is the best way that I can make a dress that looks most like the animated version of the dress, but in grounded in reality? First assumption I would have to make is that the dress is back closing. And the reason I would assume that is because there's no like animated lines in the front to suggest that this is a front closing dress. And yes, there are three buttons at top, but that's, I mean, we never see those buttons being functional. like. I don't think they're functional. Having said that, I think that Sophie would absolutely have a front closing dress because front closing dresses just make more sense for a woman who does not have a lady's maid who's gonna help dress her. So um, I do think it would most likely be front closing, but you know what, let's just assume that to make it look as close to the animated version as possible, it would have to be a back closing. On top of all that, I wanna actually put a belt at the waist, like an actual built-in waistband versus just tying it because I want, if you do that, you can have the top and the bottom be two separate pieces instead of one piece. So the skirt can be as full as you want it and the bodice can be less full as you want it. So this way I can make the skirt like five times fuller than the bodice, which I did. 
So to do this, I'm going to use the Folkwear Gibson Girl blouse pattern and just turn that blouse into a dress by adding a skirt and a waistband. The blouse itself is only shaped at the yoke and it does have a relatively full bodice and then it's gathered in by being tucked into a skirt. I decided what I would do is build my own waistband into it and then cartridge pleat a large piece of fabric to give it a fantastically large skirt. You all know I have an obsession with cartridge pleat. To do this, I started with the Gibson Girl blouse pattern and I decided to use look A. I cut two of the front yoke, one for the actual shell and one for the lining, and two each of the back yokes, one for the outside and one for the lining, and then the sleeves and then the sides. Of note, before I cut out the front yoke, I put a single pleat in the center of the yoke about where I would want the three buttons to go. I ironed this flat and then pinned it. The buttons will be sewn so it looks like there's a button front closure, but like Sophie's, mine will not be functional. And I understand that there is no line in the animation, but in reality, I feel like three disembodied buttons on a yoke standing meaninglessly is quite awkward in real life. Like, why are they there? Moving on. I started by gathering up the front blouse and sewing it into the yoke, stitching it down with a machine stitch. I did the same for the back, and then I sewed the front of the blouse to the back of the blouse by sewing each to the side pieces. All these side seams were then serged as the body of the dress will not be lined. Now this particular pattern does have a pattern piece for the collar, but I wanted my collar to look more like the animated one. So using the base of the pattern that they gave me, I drafted my own collar and first I cut out the interfacing of the collar and ironed it onto the linen. Then I cut out the four pieces of the collar, adding the seam allowances manually. I then sewed the collar pieces together using my Baby Lock Soprano, clipped and turned them right side out, and sewed this to the yoke at the top, being sure to meticulously line up my collar exactly where I wanted it. In fact, I did not show this in the video, but I did it about two, three times until I was perfectly happy with it. Please note that Sophie's collar does have lace on it. I personally find lace at the neck to be really itchy and uncomfortable, so I have purposely omitted that. After all, this is a dress designed for comfort and practicality and usefulness around my house. And yeah, so if you want lace, please add it at this step. I personally just didn't do it. Now, I started on the apron. Even though I have one apron already, I thought I could use a second one. I got a piece of linen, this one a wonderfully soft one purchased at Zadie Goodman's. She sells a little bit more expensive but high-end linen and it's probably the softest and my favorite linen to work with. So I cut a length of 24 inches long and hemmed it at the sides and the bottom and I just used the entire like seam allowance to seam. And then I gathered up the top with two running stitches and sewed it to a piece of double folded linen. I then sewed a 24 inch cotton tape on each side of the finished apron front and that was, that was the apron, it was like an hour of my life. And then I put on the apron to cook because that's what aprons are for. And Sophie cooked for her entire group, some eggs and bacon. So it seems quite a good time to talk about today's sponsor, HelloFresh, who has been generous enough to sponsor today's video. So I've been using food services nonstop since I was a resident physician because they save so much time. And this means that instead of having to think of a meal plan every week, come up with a list of ingredients, pick up the groceries, do the shopping, figure out what to do with them in the fridge because they don't fit, and then what to do with all the extra ingredients because you get like extras of this and this. I get a healthy, balanced meal. It's delivered once a week and it just saves me so much time and energy. As guilty as I frequently feel about the carbon footprint of getting food delivered, I actually recently found a study by the University of Michigan which shows that due to the decreased waste in the way that meal delivery services source their groceries and how we don't actually waste anything, a meal delivery plan actually has 25% of less of a carbon footprint than the equivalent grocery store sourced meals. I've linked it below for those of you who want to read it because studies are cool. I do sometimes have some weeks where I have less time than others, like weeks where I know I'm gonna be on three calls. Um, I tend to have a lot less time. So for those weeks, I use the quick and easy options or the lightning fast prep options. So overall, healthy, better for the environment and convenient. So if you're interested in trying it out, go to hellofresh.com and use SoSteam10 to get 10 free meals, including free shipping. So again, that's hellofresh.com and the code is SoSteam10 for 10 free meals.
let's talk about the sleeves. Of note, I decided to make my house dress a three quarter, four fifths sleeve instead of the full length. I personally find full length sleeves to be really inconvenient. Like you wash your hands and then like your sleeves are wet and then it's linen so it never dries. And then like you just walk around with wet sleeves and by the time that it dries, you have to wash your hands again. So I actually really avoid them and I just get sleeves that are at least up to here. Um, and luckily that's what this pattern came with. So I didn't have to shorten it at all. To make the sleeves, I sewed the inside seam of the sleeves and then serge this as the sleeves will also not be lined. You'll notice that anything that will not be lined will be serged. And then I gathered up the bottom edge of the sleeve, sewed it to the cuff and then turned the cuff inside out and then sewed everything down with whip stitches. I then sewed my um, sleeves in to the bodice, the usual way where I do the bottom six of the under armpit without any gathers. And then I gathered up the top of the sleeve with gathers and then fitted it to the bodice and then sewed it with a machine. I did that for the other side. Afterwards, I got the extra set of yokes I had cut, which for the lining. And please note that the front yoke for the lining does not have the pleat in the, in the middle because obviously it's a lining. It does not need a fake button hole placer. And then I sewed it to the back yoke pieces at the shoulders and then ironed the seam allowances in and then matched up the yokes in the front and the back, pinned it, tucking all the raw edges of the sleeve head as well as the other yoke into it. And then I stitched all this down by hand because I can and it looks better that way. Now the armpits of the sleeves were not covered by the yoke. I did take a moment to serge these in order to finish that seam myself. And you'll notice at this point, the bodice is mostly done. I put this on the dress form and you'll notice that the length is quite long, much longer than my natural waist. This is because the original was a blouse and the bottom was supposed to be tucked into a skirt. Mine will of course be cut down to the right length. So to figure out the right length I would have, I would actually want this at, I made myself a waistband. I then pinned it to the dress form and, and then used a friction pen to mark the top of where I wanted the waistband to go. I took off the band and then used that as a guide to put in two lines of stitching. These lines of stitching are running stitches, of course, that I could gather up easily. And they were fairly parallel to each other so that the gathers would be nice and neat. I gathered that up um, to the si same size as, as the waistband. But before I did, I marked the quarter mark so that at least at each quarter mark of the gathers, it would be fairly even. Please note, I did not put any gathers under the armpits here and here. And I did that because I wanted the sides to not kind of floof out and thereby I keep my girly silhouette as much as possible in an otherwise rather bulky dress. Then it was time to sew it to the waistband. So this is fairly similar to cartridge pleating, but cartridge pleating is you have two completely clean edges and you butt them against each other. This one you have a raw edge and you cover it with the clean edges of the waistband. So that's what I did. I, um, I first sewed it to the front of the waistband picking up the top of each gather and then stitching it carefully to the waistband and then going, picking up another gather and doing that. And I would say there's probably about eight to 10 stitches per inch in this area. And I did that for the entire front. Um, and then I folded the waistband where I put in the center fold. And then I did that for the back. In the back, I didn't really care nearly as much since there was already some stabilizers stabilizing stitches in there. So I really only had to do like maybe four stitches an inch there. I sewed the entire waistband in. Now it's time to add the buttons in the front. I got three half inch button molds. Molds are M-O-U-L-D-S. They're like these little like button shaped things that you cover with fabric to make buttons like that are covered in the historical way. I find this to be much stronger than modern, just like covering up button kits, they, which fall apart so frequently. So many regrets with those. I sewed up three of these buttons with linen scraps and making three very attractive buttons. And then I sewed them in place. Hi, Elspeth. Now basically the bodice was done and ready to be attached to the skirt. Similar to the last Ghibli core skirt, I decided to add a very skirt full skirt using cartridge pleats. Now I cut three selvage to selvage skirt lengths. And since this is a back closing dress, this would just be 
three pieces sewn end to end, but I did take a six inch wedge off of the top of the center skirt so that I could remove some of the bulk there. Then I searched the, down the raw edge. Since pockets are very important to me, I cut out four of my pocket pattern that I self-drafted to make a total of two pockets. I sewed the pocket to the sides of the trapezoidally shaped center front piece on each side three inches from the top. I then sewed the same pocket three inches from the unwedged back pieces at the side. I ironed the pocket outwards so it stuck out like so for all four pockets. I then matched up the surged edge of the front of it to the sides, matching up the pockets precisely. I then stitched the pocket. So again, I start at the top of the skirt, go down until I hit the pocket, and then turn the skirt 90 degrees, stitch around the pocket till I hit the skirt again, at this time at the bottom point, turn 90 degrees again, and then stitch all the way down to the bottom of the skirt. And that is how you sew a pocket. I then ironed everything and serge the top and the bottom of the long skirt piece. I also ironed the top 5 eighths of the skirt piece down in order to ready it for cartridge pleating. I won't go into the details of cartridge pleating, and again, um, I highly recommend watching my last video if you want a lot of details, but basically you gather up the fabric in quarters, sew the top of each pleat to the bodice. I did read The Golden Thread to kind of keep me company. Audiobooks are really awesome for this part. So it was time to do the closure. I had a really hard decision to make. Do I do buttons? Do I do a zipper? What do I do? And I honestly think buttons are much prettier than a zipper. So I did that. I got eight three quarter inch button molds and covered them and then used my Simplex gauge to mark where I wanted the buttonholes. Again, I used a machine to make the buttonholes. In this case, my baby lock soprano. I will not make buttonholes by hand. I just, I really hate doing it. So the problem is I wanted to have buttons, but I knew I wouldn't be able to close the buttons at the top of my neck. So to fix this problem, I use some buttons, one at the top of my neck and some at the waist, but then I also use snaps whose sewing I hid with fake buttons to sort of fill in the gaps. And this worked really well. I was able to get myself in and out really easily. And then I put this on, tried to figure it out which length, then put it on my dress form and pinned up the bottom of the skirt where I wanted it. I did have to cut down the skirt a little bit because it turned out I wanted a lot shorter than I expected. And then I sewed the bottom two edges of the skirt together in the back. And it's a fairly invisible point, even up close. I then marked the hem, sewed the hem, and it was done. Now for another absurdly fast get ready with me. Anyways, thanks so much for joining me. I had a really great time making this dress. I love how full it is. I I don't know, like I think, I remember I was like, okay, it's a little boxy. It's a little boxy on her. I wonder if I can make it less boxy on me. It's still boxy on me and I still love it. Like I put it on, I'm like, I'm so so thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoy this. And if you wanna see more sewing adventures with me, please join me next month for, you know, there's like five different things I'm working on right now. I don't know which one I'm gonna make a video on next. I will probably finish all five projects at some point, but I'm not 
I never know which one I'm going to actually finish because I have this tendency of having multiple projects and I just do a little bit on each one as I feel like it and I kind of rotate them in and out because in my opinion, that's all, that kind of makes sewing more fun for me. So here's a preview of all five things I'm currently working on. And we'll see which one I actually choose.